Kia ora and welcome to this week's episode of The Niche Cast, where we put a bunch of Aotearoa sporting topics up on the four coasts and have a little geese underneath the undercarriage and just get in deep into the, not the mangroves, deep into the undercarriage. How about that? Bit of mechanical information. And today we are going to discuss whether Ireland can defeat the All Blacks with 15 men on the park. Big issues of Aotearoa sport, just joking. But we are going to chat about the Black Caps playing cricket over in Ireland, as well as some rugby league warriors exist. And there's a big old NRL competition. Also got some flying Kiwis we're going to touch on. And we'll go around the grounds. How about that? A little bit around the grounds, better results, fixtures, and hard and fast topics up the top of the show as well can guarantee there'll be no All Blacks discussion. That's not what we do, but there will be plenty of other Aotearoa sporting kōrero as well. We're from the Niche Cache, the Niche Dash Cache, and that's a website that you should be checking out every day, bookmark it, tune in, tap out, and we have fresh Aotearoa Warriors yarns. There's the Flying Kiwis yarn. I dove into the Otago Vaults contracts as well, their contracted player list, which was um fun to do and there's going to be one of those pretty much every week so next week it might be canterbury and then we'll go week after that we'll go to wellington um, a little bit of local optimism and hope there for the otago cricket fraternity um just quickly otago sparks are, sparks are fantastic and then there's a nice little crop of otago vaults youngsters from the region as well so it is interesting and of course, Dean Foxcroft, new signing, fresh off his, um, what are we going to call it? His extended break. Exile. <laughs> his, his exile from Aotearoa um, during the pandemic. So he's like a new signing returning to Otago Cricket as well. All the podcasts, all the big yarns, they are always found on our website, thenish-cache.com. Check it out. Once again, bookmark it. Just Find your sport, your little niche, because it's a collection of niche niches, and find what you like and just hit it up on the regular. That's what we do. And of course, we're always uh, churning out the mahi for Aotearoa, first and foremost. Also for the Patreon whānau who support us straight up the guts via Patreon, patreon.com forward slash our niche cache. Do have a fresh Patreon, Matt Anderson. Kia ora and welcome to the whānau. He's the latest um supporter of the niche cache and every week we do a cricketing podcast so we dive deep into all things aotearoa cricket that is recorded on a tuesday prior to the variety show um so that's there for the patreon whanau reliable consistent always a cricketing podcast but we do welcome everyone else who wants to support the niche cache and join the patreon whanau as we build up as we get bigger, as we get more resources, we'll hopefully expand all that Patreon stuff out. But for now, there's just a cricketing podcast, but don't let that, you know, shut the door on your patronage. Like we're here to welcome everyone in. So if you do just want to support the Mahi and our content, our Aotearoa sporting content, join the Patreon Fano, patreon.com forward slash our niche cache. And the other big thing is the Monday, Friday email banger. It is an absolute banger. It's a slapper. It's a humdinger. And it comes twice a week straight to your email inbox. The nichecase.substack.com. That is all the links to our website and our podcast, as well as just notes on the Aotearoa sporting landscape. There's nothing like it. There's no Aotearoa sporting podcast like this, for starters. But there's also no thing, nothing like the website, now that we're thinking about it. And there's definitely nothing like the uh, email dispatch on a Monday and Friday evening. You're going to get all sorts of notes and insights and bits and pieces from the Aotearoa sporting landscape. And that is delivered every Monday and Friday evening. The nichecase.substack.com. Enter your email address and it's done. Nothing more needs to be done. Just check your email. Hi to my easy mahi. And we start our podcast with a dose of mindfulness wildcard. What do you got? What have I got? Um, this is from old mate Rumi again. Uh, what did I just say? Well, I think Persian, eh? old um, ancient Persian poet who, um, and I say this aware of the irony that I'm saying is right before we do a podcast where we're just going to spill a bunch of thoughts for the next hour or so. But um, Rumi once said, look past your thoughts. 
Look past your thoughts so that you may drink the pure nectar of this moment. I guess we're drinking the pure nectar of this moment of uh, recording a podcast. I do like in working through some of these Aotearoa sporting things, you do need, do need to sift through thoughts. Yeah. There's always like a instant reaction and it just flows on from there. And of quite often, like you've got to learn to trust your gut, trust your intuition, but quite often those early thoughts are like real bad hot takes. And then you work through them yeah. and you find the insight. Um, and it just, it starts with the thought, but then you need to get into drinking the nectar of the present moment and letting those thoughts flow on because they will help set up the context for the next thing in the present moment. Yeah. Cause those hot takes are hot for a reason. It's cause they're like, you know, fueled by emotion and, um, and those, <laughs> The emotions that you get at the end of a, a sporting contest or something in which you've been invested in in some way, like they're not always the most trustworthy emotions. Like it's part of the roller coaster, it's part of the fun of 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 um of doing this stuff, of you know, supporting a, a team or whatever. But sometimes you do need to let those things simmer and see what still remains at the end of it. Like, see, because some of that stuff is gonna boil off. And the stuff that boils off is not the stuff that you need. And so when you're in our business trying to like write stuff that contextualizes things that have happened, like, yeah, we don't want, we don't want the hot takes. It's often why we'll like give it a day or two before we write about something. Um, Cause it helps. It gives a, a, a better response, um, a more truthful response. I also think like drinking nectar really is uh, something like just the, in the literal sense, really something that's gone out of fashion over the last couple thousand years. Hey, this seems to be something that like ancient Greeks and stuff like that would always talk about. And really, I don't know if I've ever drunk pure nectar before. I, I don't really think that's something I've um, indulged in per se myself. Um, maybe it's something to try though. I don't know. It's, the ancients seem to recommend it, but maybe that's because they didn't have the same access to like honey and sugar cane and things like that. I don't know. I don't know how you drink nectar. Like, don't you need to collect? Isn't, yeah, I don't know. Um, yeah, I, I actually don't know the process. I <laughs> kind of want to go off, deep so, into yeah. the nectar mangroves, but I also don't want to go deep into the nectar mangroves because I just want to bring it back because everything you're about, you're saying about uh, sporting fandom and reacting to sports, that applies to regular day to day life. And we ground our mindfulness sure. and practical insights. So, in the same way that maybe, insights aren't best delivered fresh off another horrible loss by unnamed team maybe just don't react to that person cutting you off on the motorway the person uh wearing a mask not wearing a mask and how that makes you feel like let those things go and then find an actual insight or a learning later on just stay present in the moment with that process but for sure don't react to um the immediate thoughts and feelings and emotions that come when something tickles your toes in the wrong way well and also the like that's the one side of it and the other side of it is drinking the pure nectar of the moment it's also telling you that when you don't do that there's something way better on on offer like the moment itself is far more like living in the moment, staying present like that, far more rewarding than getting angry at the dude who cuts you off in the motorway. Right. Like, it's not just that one is a negative. It's that the other one is also a massive positive in the other direction. Yeah. Like those emotions are taking you out of yeah. the nectar of the yeah, depriving moment. you of this. <clears throat> yeah, exactly. Boom. Solve, solve, solving problems and just, uh, meaning of life right there. Yeah. There done. Sorted. Around the grounds wildcard, the Tall Blacks are playing basketball right now. I think they had a victory over India. Big up, big up. And is this is part of an Asia Cup campaign? Yes. Yeah, so the Asia what's Cup. That, um, what's that looking like over the next, between now and the variety show? Are they playing a couple more games? And are those games against equally as interesting opponents as India? um yeah more or less like they 
the the last Asia Cup that the Tall Blacks went to, they didn't send a particularly strong team. Like they left a lot of their better players behind. Um, this time, for whatever reason, I guess just busy schedules around around the grounds with a lot of stuff, like just a lot of basketball going on at the moment. They've sent an even worse team. Like the, it's very much a development team. You got like Toy Smith, Milner, and Sam Timmons are pretty much the experienced guys, and then um, a lot of Taylor Britt probably would be in that um, category now as well. And then a lot of guys who um, are younger and up and coming and not not a lot of caps to to speak of um, across the board. It's a really interesting squad. Like it's a it's a good, um, funky, well-balanced team that that looks really exciting on paper, but it's definitely like it's not even the Tall Black second strength squad. Like if you take out their full strength squad, it's probably not even a B team either. It's probably more like it's very much like a development team. Um, but they smashed India in game one. And I would imagine they're still going to be good enough to, you know, at least go. Um, I don't know how the tournaments, um, uh, you know, put together, but I'd imagine like quarterfinal-ish thing would be a realistic goal, probably good enough to make the semis if they get a, the, you know, avoid a, a top team in the um, in the initial knockouts. Like that's that's the kind of thing to expect, but very much with this team, when you look at a development team going over, you also have to be thinking about individuals and looking at like guys where they are in their career and the development opportunity that this offers. It's, it's not a tournament that the tall blacks are going being like, yeah, we want to be the best team in Asia. Like we, we want to beat everyone. We just, you know, send all the top guns and just fire away and, and blow everyone out of the water. Like this is, they're very much using this as a, um, as a stepping stone into the future kind of thing is the um, the context to keep this Asia Cup campaign in. It is, as I say, a um, a development team for the Tall Blacks. And ahead of the variety show, they will have played a game against Lebanon, which is early Saturday morning, and then another game against the Philippines, which is early Monday morning. Remember, the Tall Blacks played the Philippines recently in Aotearoa as well. So the Tall Blacks are trucking along very young squad a little bit similar to the the wider black caps group that we've been getting and Aotearoa sporting depth once once again on display in glorious fashion and it will be interesting like if they can win all of those games with a b-ish squad that's a decent sign for tall blacks basketball and a lot of these sports wildcard i've been thinking about this you know had had the immediate um emotions and feelings because the black sticks women lost their quarterfinal to germany at the hockey world cup and i'm thinking like a lot of these sports even the black caps over in europe and those type type of teams and different sports overseas during winter it's like your chance to command the spotlight like that yeah. it's not like maybe not the best time to be fighting for the spotlight when there is some sort of uh rugby union happening at the all blacks level like it is kind of tricky but for our you know this is our perspective this is you know fuck everything else we're the niche case so we don't care a lot of these other sports they do have a chance to demand spotlight and demand intrigue and that's what it was feeling like with the black sticks woman was there was that was kind of building like they probably shouldn't have finished first in their pool, but they did. And they had a real opportunity to generate some momentum and get the Kiwi hockey fandom right behind them and then bring in all the casual sports fans as well. But they lost 1-0 uh, to Germany. And that's it. Um, and then you move into Commonwealth Games. So Tall Blacks rolling through the Asia Cup, like they're not going to demand spotlight in the same way. But if they're doing some good things with a B-ish type of squad, that just builds up the intrigue. And then someone like me starts to care a bit more about Tall Blacks basketball because you can see that there's momentum and they're building something. Whereas I'm like, a, well, I cover hockey for the niche case. So I'm kind of in the op opposite position for the hockey where it's someone like you, you might be a bit more intrigued if the Black Sticks woman had a deep run into the Hockey World Cup. Right, but they kind of fumbled that bag. They slipped it up. They had a decent opportunity, narrow loss, and now it just goes back to oblivion. 
It's just nothing until we get into Commonwealth Games, Colonizer Games sports. So it is interesting just some of these sports and how they work through the background of the Aotearoa sporting landscape. Yeah, I mean, they, they didn't fumble the bag as much as they could have because they could have gone out in the group stage. Like They, they got a little bit of momentum through that and getting into the um, is it quarterfinal is quarterfinal, eh? Because I know there was some sort of like, it was a little bit tricky because you had some teams that would qualify for the next round, but they had to do playoffs, but they weren't strictly, you know, there's the, one of those things where it's the thing. Because they could have played England in the semis, um, wasn't it? If they if England had beaten Argentina, which I assume they didn't, um, and then there would have been a weird one where you end up playing a team that you beat and finished ahead of in the group. Um, but yeah, whatever. They so the getting as far as they did, I think they got something. But um, unfortunately for the Black Sticks, the All Blacks lost in the same week. <laughs> Don't forget. Unfortunately, it gets to dominate the the mainstream media for a variety of reasons, which is frustrating. I mean. But like the, the tall blacks aren't going for the same spotlight, clearly, if, if looking at the team that they've sent over. But I mean, like Tane Murray is there, um, Cruz Pero Hunt, uh, Flynn Cameron made his tall blacks debut in that Philippines game the other week. Uh, Sam Meninga's the youngest one, I think. Uh, no, Tane Murray's a few days younger than him. Max Darling's over there as well. Like those guys I mentioned are all under the age of 22. And some of them are at college right now. Um, others, you know, whatever the you know whatever route they're going in their career. But like, they're those guys in particular, just picking out the youngest guys in that team, have every chance of like, okay, they're they're in a development Tall Blacks team right now, which is not the Tall Blacks B team. It's not the Tall Blacks A team for sure. But those guys could be in a Tall Blacks A team in a couple of years' time, you know, the way, the way they're going. And this is a nice experience for them to be in a Tall Blacks environment where they get to be like, they get to be leaders beyond the, or they get to have roles beyond what they would otherwise have. Like, it's it's a nice little test. And I think it's interesting as well for those senior guys too, like Toy Smith Milner, the only guy who's played more than, um, where are we, 11 tests for the, for the Tall Blacks. Um, 26 years old, very much a fringe player for a tall black squad. Like he gets a lot of games because he's available because he plays locally. Um, probably all like a top, you know, a 12 man squad with everyone available. Don't think he probably gets there. Um, touch and go if he gets another NBL contract because he's off contract after playing a season with uh, Southeast Melbourne, I think it was. Didn't get a lot of game time and didn't didn't do great with what he had. So touch and go from him as to whether he can get back to the NBL level but at the same time he gets to be like the senior man on a tall black squad for an Asia Cup campaign like that's a pretty cool experience as well and a nice um a a nice bit of like um I guess encouragement from the coaching staff and everything to put him in that role and you know Sam Timmons is probably in a similar thing he's a you know, similar age Taylor Britt as well like these guys are 25 26 fringes of a normal tall black squad get to be senior leaders in this asia cup team and that's one of those kind of things which i think i think a lot of players really thrive on that like not everyone does but a lot of players do and will take that kind of um you get given that opportunity and will take it and become better players for it and you know um leadership's uh leadership's an empowering thing if you're the the right kind of personality for it um so like lots of lots to go along with with this Tall Blacks thing, but yeah, they're not going to get the they're not going to get a whole lot of uh, media coverage. It's not going to get a massive amount of like spillover exposure, and partly just because of the way they've chosen to to deal with this Asia Cup thing, where it's like we're not, which is not going to send the best guys, you know. Yeah, but my point is more like when you're winning, that's all that matters, and if you're winning, then you're commanding mm -hmm. attention, and the more you win, the more people care, and. If you lose, then you slip down the pecking order. And I'm not even talking about like mainstream media. I'm just talking about myself. Like I follow these sports based on who's winning. And I write about the sports that are at the peak and they're winning. Like if regardless of how they get the views or whatever, like if you're winning, you're going to get the coverage and everything you were saying about the tall blacks was actually kind of similar to the black sticks woman because they are very kind of young and compared to the squad that was at the Tokyo Olympics, quite fringy. Um, yeah, compared to some of the, the experience and 
caliber of players that were at the last Olympics, this Black Six women's squad that played at the World Cup was younger, had a lot more new players, less experienced players getting a lot more game time. And even though they had been built in over like a, you get injuries and those availabilities, so you do get some game time over the last you know year or so, it definitely skewed younger. And that kind of sets up, I think, the Commonwealth Games where they... It's kind of like three teams, three or four teams competing for a medal. So now their World Cup campaign, they did slip up when it mattered most, but that sets up the Commonwealth Games where they should be winning a medal. And that that is probably a better gauge of Black Six Women's hockey rather than the World Cup. So I am intrigued about that before. And in the same way where if we're judging like a B-ish Tall Blacks team, what they do at an Asia Cup is probably more insightful than a that other events and other combinations of the squad and all those things. The and following on, like there's rising interest in football because these football players are good, and the the all whites tend to win more games now than they used to. Football fans are competing at a higher level, so there's more interest in what they're doing. And we do have uh, these interesting times for the Flying Kiwis. There's no international football right now, but there is coming up with interesting games again, relevant games, context around those games that are, again, right, raising the buzz around football uh, from an outside looking in perspective. But right now it's all about Flying Kiwis, transfers and players uh, fighting for their futures. We mentioned, you mentioned in the Variety Show that Denmark has become a bit of a hotspot for Flying Kiwis football and how is that, like take the floor to go a bit deeper into that yarn before we get into Black Caps and NRL. What, you just explain it even further. Is there new updates? Is there players playing? Is it transfers? Like what is it specifically about the Denmark Flying Kiwis pocket that interests you more? as opposed to like, because in the variety show was kind of like, this is where there is more numbers. Like there's a growing presence of Kiwi footballers in Denmark and around Denmark. What is it that interests you about that situation? Yeah, it's, it, it is a matter of numbers, but it's not just numbers because a lot of players play in Sweden as well. And they play in lower grades in Sweden. Um, and it's not the same here. We've got players at like multiple players, men and women in the highest level in Denmark and some of our best players as well, or some of our most intriguing players. Um, that kind of culmination where you've got a bunch of really interesting individual situations that all happen to be taking place in this one, in this one country. So like, um, well, so like to run through the, the scenario again. So you've got, Callum McCowd and, and Eli Just have been there a little longer than others at um, at Helsingor, who should have been promoted last year. Like if if they, oh man, like it just re just reminded me of that experience of covering it late last season, where it was like they as they went to the championship round. So like the top half of the table splits off. You play the um, ten more games um, home and away against the other five teams in the top six. At that point, they'd lost one game all season, were like six or seven points clear at the top of the table. Top two get promoted as well, so there's even more buffer room. And they just proceeded to, out of the blue, out of nowhere, just start losing games over and over and over and over to where they missed out on promotion altogether. So an unreal bottle drop from Helsingor. Um, and unfortunately, McCowd and Just got swept up in that. But so, so the, it could so have been even better. We could have had like four Kiwis going into the Danish top flight to start this next season, but um, not quite. But they'll still be promoted, challenging for promotion this time around. As you know, hopefully they can just see it out a full season rather than eighty percent of one. So that's actually a key insight. Is there's shenanigans? That's that's what makes it interesting. Is there is some sort of shenanigan and shenanigan is all, always a good place to build a, a bit of interest for yourself yeah bad shenanigans on that front but overall they were good seasons for McCowd and just who were starting most games um scoring and setting up goals and stuff like that um yeah just a shame they didn't see it out but that's that's one 
situation. There's also, um, you know, wait, Joe wait, wait, Bell. Wait, wait. We you you ran through all the situations in the variety show. So like, just for the listener, so they don't have to go through it all again. Like, what what is actually different about the what is interesting or funky or just weird about the Denmark thing as opposed to just listing all the players involved? Like, what well, is it about this Kiwi crop in Denmark that is so interesting? It's not It's not so much listing. It's that every one of the major situations, like I'd say six players who fall into this thing, um, every one of them are in a, a uniquely interesting there place in their careers. You know what I mean? Like Joe, Joe Bell is another one. He's playing for Bromby. Signed in January, so played half a season for them. They also had a bit of a bottle job towards the end of last season, but that was maybe a bit more expected. It wasn't um, their their depth was tested a bit as part of why they're trying to sign Joe Bell mid season is to fill out their fill out their squad. Um, they had won the title a year before, but it was quite unexpected, um, and then they lost a few players after that and couldn't really quite back it up. Um, but he probably had a little bit of a difficult um, settling in period. Like he lost his spot in the starting team in the last couple of games, only the last couple of games when things didn't matter quite as much. But he's got a you know preseason now to to battle away and and do he's playing a prominent role in preseason. So I expect a big season from him now that he's actually had more time to gel with his new team. But that's a really interesting situation. Like Joe Bell having been bought for money is not a free transfer. Like they went out and bought him. They, they paid Viking money to, to bring him from Norway to Denmark. He's now like looking to take that next step in his career. And um, like Marco Stamenich is probably the most interesting of these right now because he's at FC Copenhagen who just won the title last year. They are the best team in Denmark. He spent almost all of last season out on loan in the second tier. So playing against um, Callum McLeod and, and Eli just a little bit. Um, I'm trying to think of whether there were any good head to heads between them. Cause those three are all LA Academy guys, but I can't remember anything. So they can't have been that eventful. Um, but he's back at Copenhagen right now. They've just played their three preseason friendly. He's only got through three of them, but he played a role in all of them. He started the first one, played center back curiously, came off the bench in the second one. The first one was very much like a second, a, you know, a second 11. And he started, um, started a first 11, the next two. And he was one of the first guys off the bench in both of them. They did have one of their key midfielders injured, which pushes them up the picking order a little bit. But effectively, he is trying to make the first team squad like he's trying to say don't send me out on loan again like i'm ready to come in and play minutes for these guys for the best team in denmark a team that has champions league qualifiers coming up in a couple months um six weeks in fact and not just champions league qualifiers but as a champions of denmark it's the last round of champions league qualifiers so if they win they're through to the group stage if they lose they just drop into the europa league group stage so there's guaranteed european football either way Marco Stamenich is like, mate, I want to be a part of that. He's out there trying to trying to show what he can do. I see they've given him his his number back, which is nice. Um, officially, when they named the squad list, so that I don't know if that means anything. They could still send him out on loan, but I think one thing that's really interesting here as well that works in his favor is that the Danish league starts this upcoming week. Like I might have buried the lead a little bit. That. We're talking about how important all this stuff is. Like it's about to start. We're not just in preseason stuff anymore. It's about to really start. Um, and the reason it's starting so early is because there's this stupid Qatari World Cup that we didn't want to be a part of in the first place. So we don't care that we didn't qualify for. It's not important. Who cares? Um, dumbass World Cup in November. <clears throat> means that all the leagues got to take a break around November, which means Denmark in particular trying to, because they have a long break as well in January, because um, it's just too cold to play football. <laughs> they have a, like a winter break there for about a month. They basically have to start in July rather than a month later when they would have otherwise. So they're starting early, but the transfer window is the same. So potentially they could still send them out on loan in six weeks time which gives him six weeks where he might have this little buffer zone with the first team where they can, even if they're planning to send him out on loan, they don't have to do it yet. And most other countries haven't started yet. So there's no reason to send him so early unless it's to another Danish team, which is what happened last year. And so they might still be likely, but you would hope he would go to a, like a, a um, trying to remember what the Danish top to flight is called the Super League. Um, ideally, he'd go to a lower Super League team this time rather than another second division team. But um, 
maybe he won't go out on loan at all if he's if he's good enough for that first team. So that's a really that's a really exciting situation for one of our top up and coming players. But then also on the women's side, you've got um, HB Coach, which is actually the team that Staminich played for on loan last year. But their men's team is like bottom half of the second division. Their women's team are reigning champions reigning champions who have tried to bolster their squad for their title defense by signing Daisy Cleverly, her first um, professional bout. So that's really exciting as well. A good, you know, talented um, Kiwi up and coming player. He's had to wait a bit. She did extra year of college um, in the United States. She's about 24 or 25 now. So a bit later into the professional scene, but like her first gig is for a Champions League team. So that's pretty handy. And then Indy Page Riley, who's, played one game for Australia and has just recently um, switched allegiances to the nation of her birth and the nation she, her family's all from, the nation that she lived until she was 12 years old. Um, she wants to be a football fern. She will go straight into the football ferns as well. Um, she plays for Fortuna Hering, which are another one of the title contending teams, and she has already played Champions League for them. I looked into the four Champions League games that she played. She played 90 minutes against Barcelona two seasons ago. Like, Barcelona that year won the Champions League. They beat Chelsea 4-0 in the final. They were the best team in Europe. They beat um, they beat Fortuna 9-0 over two legs. So um, pretty emphatic there. But but Indy Riley got like good minutes against the best team in Europe. She's only 20 years old now. It's like this is um this is another fascinating thing. And it's a fascinating one because she's been there for a couple of years, but she's only just become in, come into like football phones contention, which all of these, like all these situations are interesting in themselves. And it's just this thing where you've got like six really fascinating players at key junctures in their careers, different kinds of junctures as well. Like it's not all the same situation. It's they're unique compared to each other. All in Denmark. And the Danish season about to kick off very soon. I don't think the women's one. The women's um all women's football at the moment, basically everywhere except like America, um, at the top level is pre- either in their off season or in a mid-season break because You've got the women's Euros are on. You've got the women's uh, African Cup of Nations is on. You've got the women's um, whatever the CONCACAF one is, the the Copa Sudamerica or whatever it's called, um, the South American one. Like these four major confederational th- um, championships are all on right now and of relevance to New Zealand as well because these – with the exception of the Euros, these tournaments also count as World Cup qualifying. So these are teams that the football ferns could potentially be hosting, potentially even playing um, in 2023, seeing how some of these um, some of these things go down. So the Danish, you know, um, Daisy Cleverly, Indy Riley going to have to wait a little bit longer than Marco Stamich and Joe Bell, but all part of the big Danish... Um, the- <laughs> The Danish exploration, the, I don't know, the Danish, um, I'll have to come up with a better, better phrase for it, but um, Denmark is the, apparently the place to be at the moment. The Danish den for flying Kiwis football. Danish den is a good one, yeah. Um, so as you're speaking, I was just like writing down some words that came to mind. Shenanigans definitely came to mind, good or bad. There's some sort of shenanigans which basically alludes to the unique nature of each player and their yep. career. All those folks are kind of young as well, which I think is interesting. They they skew, do skew a bit younger on the um, in the Aotearoa footballing ranks, which is interesting. Like, just reflective it, of a lot of our professional players, though, is a lot of them are young players that are at that stage of their careers. Um, yeah, it just don't get too specific. Like, right? we're just rolling. Let me express my uh, my words here. And the other one was now, which. It's different to the nice. woman, but you gave some context there, which is important that the woman's football is on hold because it's preparing to sort itself out to come to Aotearoa and Australia yeah, pretty much. for the World Cup. So all the men's stuff is interesting because they're young Kiwis in funky situations and it's happening right now. And then as we explained with the woman, there is some uh, World Cup preparation and World Cup context. Black Caps Cricket Air Wild Card. What? I'm again. You just did your. Um, I try. I tried to wrangle you as best as I could in that in that brain dump of the Denmark connection to our Tedo football. And I'm going to do a similar wrangling here. I'm just like, is there one idea that sat with you since 
the second ODI. So two ODIs against Island Black Caps are won the series, but is it just one idea that sat with you moving into where we are now on Thursday ahead of the third ODI? One idea. Um, the, I think it's a matter of similar to what was saying about some of that stuff at the start of the podcast. I, it feels like a thing about depth. Um, and I think it goes both ways because I think there's been situations where you see like Michael Bracewell coming in and going ballistic. Um, I see Crick Info finally updated his, his profile picture as well, which is it's nice. They were rolling with that one from the under 19 World Cup about more than a decade ago up to that point. Um, uh, he's finally announced himself, I guess. Um, him coming out of a little bit of nowhere and being, well, not nowhere, but, you know, um, very early in his international career and being like, yeah, no, I'm just really good at this thing. Um, that's that's a positive reflection of depth. I do think there have been instances where, like, um, I haven't loved Blair Tickner's work so far. Um, I think Jacob Duffy was a little bit up and down, some some decent um, parts of his spell in his on his debut and somewhere is a little bit not so much loose but just like didn't really feel like he was threatening um in the same way but also it was a much better bowling performance i think led led by matt henry who got things started really well like he's not quite what jasper boomer did it to england the other day in an odi but it was um really sharp work from henry showing and reminding everyone again that he's the absolute man at odi cricket um, he was tough to get away. Um, Santa was very good, but they bowled him at the death, so he got his um, got his figures padded out a little bit um, against him. But like the guys you would expect there were leading the way, um, but in a different role because Matt Henry doesn't normally get the recognition because he's bowling with Ferguson, Saudi, Bolt, whoever, and those are obviously the leaders of the of the crew. So it's a little bit like Toy Smith Milner stepping up or whatever. Um, in this case, like strip away the other guys and Matt Henry's left as the spearhead and he he bowled really well I thought um didn't this like he could have been more reflected in his wickets but um and I thought they probably should have brought him back a little bit earlier and um rather than saving his last couple overs till the last couple of the game but so it goes um and then like on the batting side as well like Finn Allen scored 60 odd beautiful like that's that's what we want to see from Finn Allen a good aggressive batting hitting the ball high and far and hard and um, getting things off to a nice start at the at the top of the innings. Um, that kind of, like, it's not like there's a um, conclusion to this idea about depth. That, like, the idea doesn't necessarily, because we're, you know, two games into an extended series where it's limited overs tour, where it's all about depth from one start, from the start to the end. We're, we're at the beginning of that. Um, so it's not like I can offer conclusions, but we are getting good insights um, into a lot of these things and where some of the guys stand when you take away a, a selection of the best test players and don't put them in the limited over squads, how does that look? And it's going to get a little bit, you know, after the Ireland ODIs, I think things get a little bit even more dipping into the depth, some, um, you know, further than what they already are at. So. That's the exciting part of this, I think, and that's what we've seen so far. And it's it's too early to to throw out like lessons and learnings, but we're in that experience of of just seeing what things look like for the Black Caps beyond the guys we expect to be running the show and and scoring all the runs, taking all the wickets. Those connections to the tall blacks and some of the black stick stuff and just the depth on display is interesting, especially that Matt Henry note about he's like he's he's he featured in both innings both games sorry whereas ish sodi uh lockie ferguson they only played one game mitchell santner's only played one game so it's like who's the leader of the bowling attack well right now it looks like matt henry and that's a fantastic opportunity for him as you said he's usually playing amongst better bowlers or more experienced bowlers where right now he's the you know, he's one of the main dudes um, alongside the spin extraordinaire, Michael Bracewell. The, just rolling through the series, like Will Young hasn't done much. Henry Nichols hasn't done much. Like there's lads who are performing and not performing. And that's going to happen. 
and we just kind of roll with that. But I am, I continue to be most interested in Finellan at the top of the order and how he's settling into his role. Um, this is all shaded by the fact that Finn Allen loves to smash a cricket ball. Which every Kiwi cricket fan should know. And now we're starting to see him adapt to international cricket where maybe you can't do that every single innings and you do need to adapt to what's happening. And he's showing flashes of that. Like there are glimpses of Finn Allen learning his craft and perfecting his art form which the Finn Allen, <clears throat> excuse me, the Finn Allen art form is smashing a cricket ball. But to do that, you still need the right resources. You need the right paints. You need the old uh, painting frame and all the canvases and all that shit. And that the cricketing equivalent of that is getting yourself in, facing deliveries, adapting to the pitch, uh, tinkering your game to the scenario and then smashing the cricket ball. And I think Finn Allen is showing a balance of that, which I, at this level, is interesting. I think we should always expect a cricketer like Finn Allen to do that at this level, like on purely because you can't smash a cricket ball as much as baseball revolves around that idea. Like it's very difficult to do and many bat batters have come into international cricket guns blazing and then had their ends of career come swinging around tomorrow whereas finn allen seems to be learning and growing and developing his craft which i find quite interesting um in a similar way that you might see signs of michael bracewell learning how to apply his skill set to this black caps team because when he's batting for wellington he's usually he might bat as high as number three he might you know he generally sticks around that middle order coming in number four or five across all formats whereas batting his black caps role is more of a mitchell santner ruchin revenge role where you're batting down the order but you also bowl a bit of spin like <clears throat> glenn phillips is batting ahead of bracewell for example and then there's guys like Henry Nichols, Will Young, Finn Allen, Tom Latham, they're all, Martin Guptill, they're all trying to get their time at the crease as well. But Michael Bracewell is adapting his skill set to this role with the Black Caps. And those little nuances of how these dudes wiggle into the, the Black Caps group and international cricket, specifically in this series and their roles in this series, because in a different team, a different New Zealand team, Michael Bracewell might have a different role. Finn Allen might have a different role in a different team as well. Like in T20 cricket, Finn Allen doesn't need to face a couple of deliveries and, and assess the tempo of his innings as he needs to do in this series, in this ODI format. And those are just some low key wrinkles. Like we're not looking for the best player in the series right now. Like we've said that many times, we're just looking to assess these performances in the entirety of the euro excursion but there are some signs and just learning how different players adapt to black caps cricket international cricket and and this format is quite interesting yeah it was a nice um 60 or 58 balls for finn allen which is still a strike rate above 100 but he hit three sixes and six fours like which tells you that I, I, I'm not going to do that math off the top of my head, but um, that, that'd be around two thirds of his runs and boundaries. But that also tells you that like he wasn't hitting everything. You know, he wasn't going out there feeling like he has to smack ball after ball after ball after ball. He was showing the right patience to like um, a get some singles. You know, turn the strike over. I looked at his um, wagon wheel. He scored runs in every section of the of the. Um, of the of the field so that's also what you want to see a good sign of a well-rounded batsman um also tells you he was not only waiting for the right balls to hit but he was punishing them because he still did hit three sixes and you know six other fours right so there's nine boundaries in his innings he 
when the ball was there to hit, he hit it and he he did like, you know, he punished it in the way that he needed to. Um, but he didn't feel like he had to chase after it in the same way, which I think was quite mature from him. I was actually, I was quite impressed by um, by what I saw from Finn Allen there. And I think that's a really good sign for him moving forward um, because he is in a, he is in a really interesting place. I know we talk about him a bit, but that, this is why, because he's, A, he feels like the natural successor to Martin Guptill in white ball cricket. But B, Martin Guptill's still playing. So he's competing against other guys to partner with Martin Guptill at the moment, which also means that these, these opportunities are great for that combination um, in ODIs and in 2020 cricket. Like, it's just good to see them batting together and, and getting used to whatever kind of dynamics they have to play because it is a bit different. Like, go, Guptill batting with Allen means that Guptill doesn't have to be the aggressor in the same way. He can also pick his moments a bit more. So there is a nice, a nice thing going there. But yeah, it's, it's, I mean, it's, it's just a good opportunity for Finn Allen to, to grow his game in that kind of way. And I think the signs so far have been, have been pretty nice from one of our more enticing uh, current, certainly white ball prospects. And generally speaking, series win over Ireland. They've got, yeah. they've already quali- put themselves into qualification zone for the uh, ODI Super League, which qualifies for the World Cup. So I think we should expect the Black Caps to win the third ODI, and they should do this so. And if they're playing somewhere close to the best of their ability, and there are players, like just how they change the team from game one to game two. There's going to be players who want to perform. And as long as that's the case, I think the Kiwis are going to be pretty damn impressive in the third game. And I just think it's good bounce back after that test uh, kerfuffle. Like we've just got back into some solid cricket. Yes, of course, not everyone's scoring runs. And yes, of course, these aren't perfect performances, but we are getting... I think it's more just like where there's, we're learning about players and we're rolling through the sorting hat process. We're still in the um, the great hall of Hogwarts and everyone's just rocking up to the to the front of the room, getting the sorting hat on and being sorted into their into their respective uh, houses or zones. And that's what we're at. we're still in the in the great hall. We're eating some kai, watching everyone else get sorted, and just learning through the process. And I think. We're still we're going to be in that zone for a couple more weeks. So it's that's the the key lesson here is just to keep stay mellow, stay chill, learn about the players, learn about their skill set. But we're certainly not here to come in with any um, grand conclusions about Aotearoa cricket because you're mentioning like Finn Allen, right? The dude's competing with like Devin Conway for selection yeah. or Kane Williamson. Like it's a very interesting uh, phase for Aotearoa cricket. And an interesting phase in the NRL, nonetheless, as well. It's as far as Kiwi NRL funk goes, it is a bit of a, it just doesn't feel, it is, does feel a bit lackluster with um, buzz for this round. Um, but it is a hearty NRL game. And I am here to say, Wildcard, the Warriors won't win many games this season to finish the season. I think they got eight games. I think they play the Bulldogs and their last game is the Titans. Those feel like winning games, but the Bulldogs have got a bit of momentum recently and that will be a niggly match. So the Warriors have like eight games left and I think they could win two or three. And in writing about the Warriors this morning, it was clear like just because some things have changed, our expectations shouldn't change. Like just because they're playing the odd game at Mount Smart doesn't mean they're a good footy team. And just because it feels like the end of the pandemic situation doesn't mean it is the end. Like they still have COVID cases and all that stuff in their squad. So that that all sets up just how I'm viewing the Warriors and thinking about the Warriors is learning about next season. So maybe the theme here is that we're just gathering information about all these sports and all these teams mentioned in today's podcast to take us forward. Because like, that's how I feel about the Warriors. Like... I'm watching the Warriors and I'm zoning in on the players they have signed for next season. How are they performing? Especially someone like Ronald Volkman, the young half. He's learning his craft. And he actually, funnily enough, Wildcard, unlike Black Cap spinners, 
oh, but he's not playing this week. He's got the virus. That's right. So, oh. but if if old uh, Vol- if Volkman is playing, he has time and space to learn about NRL halves play, whereas Black Cap spinners were never given time and space to learn about test spin bowling. And other athletes that we've mentioned and talked about, like they aren't given that time and space in a really difficult role. Like what's if Chanel Harris DeVita was just given the number six jersey for two seasons straight? Things might look a bit different. Instead, he's be, he was thrown all over the show. And I think the key thing now moving forward is someone like Ronald Volkman just getting time just to play NRL footy and even... Wade Egan and Freddie Lussick in the hooking roles, just having time to to play NRL footy. And of course, everyone wants to win. Of course, the club, all their messaging is going to be around winning, but I'm here to say the Warriors aren't going to win many games to round out the season. And thus, we need to learn about how next season's going to look and learn about the players involved to finish this season. And it's convenient that they now face the Parramatta Eels on Friday night because the Parramatta Eels are quite good and they have been up and down with their form. But I still believe they're a top four-ish NRL team. But more importantly, they've got some fascinating Kiwi NRL funk in their lineup as well. Warriors fans, you're playing Marata Niokori this week. He is joining the Warriors next season. You're going to have those sorts of games to round out the season. Um, but the Eels are going to beat the Warriors probably. And that's going to happen many more times to uh, round out the season. So key messaging here is just don't expect anything with the Warriors just because there is some um, glitz and glam and neon lights around the Warriors right now. They are not a better footy team because of that. Yeah, nice one over the Tigers doesn't doesn't suddenly scream premiership contender or anything does it is it's not quite um not quite how it goes but well you do, um, but just because you mentioned the tigers i was interested to see isaiah papaliti might stay with the eels so he doesn't necessarily want to that's right there yeah. was a headline about him not wanting to go to the tigers and yeah no shit the dude who like recruited him the aotearoa kiwis coach michael Maguire, was sacked and Isaiah Papali is basically gone from a good team to a shit team. So the only downside is his personal salary. Like, I think a lot of teams, if you get rid of the people who recruited the player, why does the player want to come to your club? Money is going to be a big reason, but if you're someone like Isaiah Papali, who's pretty humble, pretty chill, and he's got a, he understands a good situation... He's probably willing to give up some money to stay with the Parramatta Eels. So I was encouraged by that because I don't want to see Isaiah Papali go to the Tigers. Fuck no. Like the Eels are fantastic at developing players. And I put like Hayes Perham scored four tries. And I uh, clipped up some highlights of that. That dude looks like a fucking... He's fast. He's mo- he's aggressive. He looks awesome. And now... Other dudes like Offa Hickey Ogden. He was with the Bulldogs. Now he's at the Eels. Curious about his development. Uh, Makahisi Makatoa was in second division Super League. Division 1 or whatever it's called. Then he came to the Eels. Now he's a really good NRL player. But the Eels have very good development set up. And that's why it was kind of like you go to the Eels and you bump up your value. That was that happened with Isaiah Papali'i, and it's happened with Maratini Okori. Like they have literally maybe doubled their value, rough estimates, just being at the Eels, and that is the impact of a top tier development club. Yeah, and the opposite of that is trying to be signed by the Tigers. <laughs> the developing players versus signing the guys who got developed elsewhere, paying overs for them, and then still having them having like doubts about whether they actually want to see through that contract. In which case, I'm sure, um, I, I didn't read too much into that other than also having a similar initial feeling to you when I saw that um, about how he might, you know, backflip is the word they like to use. Um, and thinking, cool, <laughs> good i i would prefer if he backflipped and stayed at a stronger team that could maybe compete for titles down the line for the next few years as opposed to going to a team that is in a little bit of a 
complete shambles, <laughs> a little, little bit of a complete shambles. Um, and, and I'm sure like, no doubt the, the way that the Aussie rugby league media works, they'll play this off as a, you know, uh, um, uh, an inconsistent individual decision. Like he's the one betraying them kind of thing, but you also have to look at that and like from the player's perspective, um, what have the Tigers done since he agreed that, to that thing? Like, what have the Tigers done to make him feel good about that decision? Nothing is probably the, the bottom line of that. Like, nothing. Probably only things that have made him feel worse and more uncomfortable. So I don't think a, I would imagine... I'll just say, if I were a Tigers fan, I would understand that that kind of... Um, if he's having doubts, I would fully understand that um, and understand the reasons why. And I think the Warriors have probably been on the wrong end of that a little bit as well. Um, for slightly more devious reasons, if you're looking at like Matt Lodgy type things and and whatever, that's a different, slightly different context because you've got the living in New Zealand versus living in Australia, not having to move when you're already in Brisbane kind of... Um, scenario going on but i reckon that's probably a a lesson that could be spread out of i mean you think about what sean marx is doing with the brooklyn nets at the moment there's probably a lot of like who could we sign well who actually like like sitting back and being re realistic like after everyone who was on the team had such a miserable time of it last year like who who actually wants to come and play with us um in this current situation even though we seem to have on paper a title contender where well, you've got a you got to look at yourself in the mirror as a as an organization in that situation um but back to the warriors because we have had this kind of i mean it's easy to say it with the tall blacks for example um that theme of like gathering information and and assessing players who were on the way up kind of thing when you pick a squad of 12 who were all players in that situation it's easy to say who to look for like the, the 12 guys like <laughs> look at the guys they've picked they're the ones in the um they're the ones that we've been told to look at for this reason um what are the things that you're looking at for the warriors then with like specific uh specific emphasis on next season and building forward from that volkman is a big one just watching yep. him play footy um and we can't forget like he was a highly regarded junior at the roosters he wasn't a highly regarded junior at a good development club yeah yeah at the tigers or titans or these clubs he was at the roosters and i'm just curious how he yeah again time and space in the nrl as i said before there's like i just if you think about the core group of warriors and the players they have signed for next season those are both encouraging pockets to dive into like you've got the big dogs Sean Johnson, Tohu Harris, Adam Fanua, Blake as big dogs in the leadership sense, as the leaders of the club. But then you're looking at younger leaders like Bunty Arfoa, Josh Curran, Wade Egan, Jazz Tavanga. Adam Pompey's got some mana as well, I think, and he's he's growing into that uh, role, that um, angle, which I think is encouraging. So as, uh, from that perspective, it's the core group that is going to form the core group that is going to play a lot of NRL footy to finish the season, like all those dudes are going to be playing NRL every week, and they are the core group who want to be Warriors next season and beyond. There are situations like uh, Jesse Arthurs. He is only on loan. And he, so again, what we're talking about, Matt Lodge, Reese Walsh, those players, Jesse Arthurs is on loan from the Broncos so there is no and he's under contract to the broncos so there is no expectation or automatic situation that he will stay with the warriors so we need to keep that in mind and the other person in that boat is dejan Asi, who i think is a perfectly fine player and i'm curious to see how he progresses through the season but he has no contract for next season so he left the Cowboys to join the Warriors for this season, and he's got no deal afterwards. So he, unlike like Jesse Arthurs, is contracted to the Broncos for next season. Dejan Arce does not have a contract for next season. So he's battling for a new gig, um, and that might be with the Warriors, but that's going to happen in reserve grade. So maybe the best way to view this is going through down the levels. You've got the core group of NRL players who are playing NRL to finish this season, 
and will form the core group of, for next season. Then you've got the new recruits and they are scattered across the NRL and they are going to be playing against the Warriors or you're going to be watching them in highly visible games. Like you might be tracking Mitch Barnett with the uh, Newcastle Knights. You might be tracking Dylan Walker with the Sea Eagles. I think the Warriors play the Raiders and whether Sean's Nickel Clockstab plays that game, I don't know, but um, you'll be tuning in to see him play. And then below that, you've got these dudes who are playing. I think the Redcliffe Dolphins are sixth in Queensland Cup. Dejan Asi has been starting half and he's won three games, drawn one. And I think the Redcliffe Dolphins Q Cup team have won their last four games. So guys like Iliasar Katoa, Rocco Berry, Dejan Asi, they are going to be playing in a decent reserve grade team. And I don't think those dudes are going to play NRL unless there's like availability, uh, spots open up in the team. Because what I think is happening is those dudes just need regular football. In the wider context of the NRL landscape, lack of reserve grade, lack of junior football over the last few years. I'm seeing this quite a lot actually because very like here, here's the tangent. Uh, I will say just on that Warriors thing, it's like reserve grade. Then you've got under 21 to Redcliffe. You've got stuff back in Aotearoa. National secondary schools tournament, representative teams, first 15 rugby. I wrote about all that. There's all these pockets you can kind of dive into and learn about with the Warriors. But I, I was thinking about this idea wildcard. We had so many Kiwi NRL debutants in recent years, and a lot of them, uh, there is no like trend as to what they are doing now. Someone like Nofahu White, who was fantastic prospect with the Roosters, made his debut last year. He's stuck in reserve grade. Other players are being selected over the top of him. You've got someone like Tuki Mihia Simpkins, Rotorua Boys High School, left the Cowboys to join the Tigers. Tigers suck. And Simpkins made his debut last year and is now playing under-21s. And he can't get out of under-21s. So then I come into the Warriors and Taniela Otakulo made his NRL debut last year and is now playing under 21s. So if uh, Warriors fans obviously hate themselves, so they're like, well, oh, Otakulo sucks. Like he's back in under 21s. He's terrible. This is terrible player development. But this is a trend across a lot of other NRL clubs that I have noted through the Kiwi NRL lens, through that debutant lens, because now I'm looking at some of those debutants and they have gone backwards. So all of that just feels like it's part of this messy situation where a lot of those dudes, like Otakulo made his NRL debut without playing reserve grade. So he only played under 21s and NRL last year. So I'm kind of processing that and thinking about that through the lens of what is best for these players? Football. Playing football. And if you're Taniela Otakulo in this example, you're not going to be playing 80 minutes of reserve grade with Redcliffe. Because it's a, it's a niggly situation. You've got two different clubs trying to form a reserve grade team together. Redcliffe have their own hookers and they might have players they're trying to build into an NRL squad next year, right? But Otakulo at best will be playing like a bench role. Even if everything was smooth sailing, these two clubs love each other, which we've learned now Redcliffe and Warriors kind of hate each other um, in, a, in a weird way, even though they collaborate. Um, very weird situation now. But the best case scenario is Otakulo is playing off the bench in reserve grade. And that's, that's helpful. He's playing against men, although he did play against men back in Auckland for Otahu Premiers. Maybe the best thing is just minutes. Because he can play 80 minutes at starting hooker for a good Redcliffe under-21s team. They are third. They are the third best under-21s team in Queensland. And they have Warriors players in their team. They're actually first equal. But third via points difference. And I've been thinking about that wildcard because... Some of these Warriors players have dropped down from reserve grade down to under-21s. So Tenyala Otakulo, the Kepu twins, 
they have gone down from reserve grade two under 21s. And I just think those kind of dudes need football, just straight up football, minutes, repetition. And they're going to get those minutes and repetition at their under 21s level. And that is going to set up returning to Auckland, full preseason training. And then you'll, they'll probably step up into the Warriors reserve grade team, New South Wales Cup next season, fringe of NRL. It is, yeah, it's that Kiwi NRL situation of watching players that played NRL last season slide back down and the value of reserve grade footy and all those things and getting minutes and all that stuff has been a bit of a washing machine in my head trying to process it, um, especially with the Warriors because their situation is tricky and niggly with the Redcliffe combination. But at least both teams are fairly good. And like the Redcliffe under under 21s team this week has Ali Liatawa, Sefanayo Kauli Lupo, um, the Kepu twins, Otakula, Leighton Finau, Zion Maiu'u, Jacob Laban. And how about this one? Liatawa, Kauli Lupo, and Jacob Laban, they were all playing in the Future Warriors under 18s game a few weeks ago. And they are straight back into under 21s footy in Queensland. And they're in a good under 21s team. So it's all very complicated, very uh, complex and nuanced. And um, none of it lends itself to uh, hot takes. Like none of it lends itself to the Warriors sucker junior development because Otakula is not playing reserve grade. There's so much nuance involved and that nuance is evidenced just in the Warriors bubble but also elsewhere, other clubs, where someone like Simpkins was playing reserve grade and NRL last season, and now he is only playing under 21s. It's all very interesting. Yeah, this, this Warriors versus Redcliffe beef is so funny because a lot of it's like, um, I don't know, it's, it's just weird when you have these two teams that are supposedly feud. A lot of it seems to be like the Redcliffe weren't very happy that they didn't get a shot at Reese Walsh or whatever. And um, Warriors aren't too happy that Redcliffe have, you know, snapped up their player development guy a while back and, and a few other things like that. But then at the same time, they're sharing well, resources still. Like it's, it's always like left hand doesn't know what the right hand's doing. Like well, on the one hand they're shaking hands and then they're also with the other hand, like trying to slap each other in the face. It's a weird little beef there. I think the beef is just literally the Warriors and Peter O'Sullivan don't like each other. And Peter O'Sullivan, it, it honestly could be that simple, yeah. Well, it is. And Peter O'Sullivan, his son was with the Warriors and he left. Matt Lodge was with the Warriors, son-in-law, he left. So it's clear <laughs> where that. that beef lies and I know which side of that beef I reside on. Like, I'm not... Yeah. <laughs> like, um, Peter O'Sullivan just looks like a slimy dude. So I know which side of that beef I'm 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 chilling on. Um, but and if you're a, a reserve grade coach for Redcliffe, that doesn't affect you. Like that's got nothing to do with you. You're just trying to win games week in week out, and you're picking the Warriors dudes who are available and who are committing to your team and whatever. And there's there's no dramas there whatsoever. Like it doesn't. Whatever the NRL level beef is, that clearly doesn't filter down, and and nor should it. Yeah, and then they do have guys like Katoa, Rocco Berry. Um, even the, like these dudes sh sh probably won't be at the Warriors next season, but Pride, Pedersen, Rabati, Jackson, Frey, they are playing reserve grade footy with Redcliffe. Like the Warriors still have players in the Redcliffe uh, reserve grade team. Um, but I'm just like thinking about that idea. Why do, are there any other examples off the top of my head of... Um, that kind of skewed development. There are players like junior players who uh, played SG ball and now they're back in Aotearoa. Like that stuff is happening um, at a lower level. Just scrolling through the team list as we wind up this podcast. Nofahu White is a big example for Sydney Roosters because he's not even featuring in the wider squads for game day. And there's a bunch of other middle uh, forwards who have overtaken him. Um, there was a bit of it with like Morgan Harper at the Manly Seagulls 
was pretty damn impressive last season, slipped up a little bit this season, and fell out of the mix. Now he's back in the mix. Um, but yeah, I don't uh, have any other examples off the top of my head, but I think there we are seeing like a the impact of all the messiness of like no reserve grade footy, no like under 18s, under 20s footy. Yes, it's back this year. Yes, so there's been patches of it, but just the consistency and how that looks on the at the end of the player development cycle. Um, and how that impacts player development does seem to be uh, having an impact. But also those players, like, if you played NRL and you're now playing under 21s, or if you played NRL and you're now stuck in reserve grade, might be looking for another club. Because you want to play NRL. You think you're an NRL player. So that might present opportunities as well, especially if you're, if you're stuck at the Tigers. And, like, again, Michael Maguire recruited Tookie Simpkins from the Cowboys. It was a key reason why he went there. And now Simpkins is stuck in under-21s, not playing NRL. So he probably wants to play NRL. His coaching mentor's gone, and it's all a bit of a mess. So it's, uh, it's tricky times, um, and we will wrap up the podcast there. We'll be back early next week with the Variety Show. Patreon Cricket Podcast comes early in the week. Email banger tomorrow and lots of lots of Kiwi sports coverage on our website, thenews-case.com. Big it up to yourself. Love yourself. Mouldy order. Stay beautiful. Kia kaha. Cha-cha.